Welcome everyone to OLC Live. Um, we are a couple months out now from OLC Accelerate, which will be going on November 14th through 16th in Orlando this year. Um, and today we wanted to uh, start off the, the conversation here on OLC Live with one of our keynote speakers, Professor Jean Twinga, at San Diego State University. Uh, Professor Twinga has recently uh, written another book called iGen, Why Today's Super Connected Kids Are Growing Up Less Rebellious, More Tolerant, less happy and completely unprepared for adulthood and what that means for the rest of us. Um, there are a lot of different interesting aspects of this book and of uh, Dr. Twinga's work, um, particularly for us in online education, uh, how students are using technology, but really how they're using that technology has a lot to say about their, their mental health, uh, their uh, progression towards adulthood, their progression towards independence as young adults. And I wanted to sort of dive into all of those topics today. So welcome, Gene, and thanks for, for joining us. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about your background and how, how this work came about? Yeah, so uh, my research is focused on generational differences. And that mostly means analyzing data based on some pretty big surveys of high school students and college students that go back in time, which is really powerful because then you can see how the generations differ from each other at the same age. You can take age out of the equation because everybody's the same age and see, well, how is iGen different from the millennials just before them and from Gen X and from boomers? So in uh, analyzing this data, around 2011 or 2012, I started to notice some shifts in behavior and attitudes and happiness and mental health that made me realize, wait, you know, this is a probably is not millennials anymore. We have a new generation who's really been shaped by technology and the smartphone, and I call them iGen. So it looks like they're the folks born about 1995 and later, so they are pretty much all traditional age college students. And do you think, uh, are we still, are children being born right now still part of the iGen, or do you see a cutoff date? Well, I put the cutoff date in the book, um, when I wrote the book iGen, I put the cutoff date uh, for 2012, but that could definitely be revised as data continue to come in. So these are everybody who's in grade school right now, and then up to, I guess, 23, 24-year-olds. Um, so presumably most of our undergraduate, uh, although, of course, we have uh, a whole age range of undergraduates. Um, and you've done work before on millennials and Gen Xers. So can you, can you give us sort of a broad overview of some of the differences between how you saw millennials and Gen Xers going through their educational environment versus the iGen? And just what are some of those big differences? Yeah, so for um, Gen Xers and in particular for millennials, what really shaped that generation was the growth of individualism in the culture. More focus on the self, less focus on social rules. So that has things like a positive view of the self, lots of self-confidence, optimism, high expectations. It also includes things like more emphasis on tolerance and equality and uh, being inclusive. That's all part of, all of those things are part of individualism. And that's what really made millennials stand out. Then there was a sudden shift into iGen, who's less optimistic, who's um, just less confident in themselves, but they've continued some of the trends uh, in terms of valuing quality and inclusivity. And some of the, the stuff that I was particularly surprised about in reading the book was, was that sort of lack of individualism or the lack of, of want for autonomy. Uh, you talk about a delayed onset of, of adulthood, delayed onset of, of drinking, of driving, of, um, of, of wanting to have kids, wanting to start a family. So could you talk a little bit about that? Um, give us a preview of that, that delayed onset of adulthood, that slow, slow childhood, I guess. Yeah, you know, we've known for a while that young adults are, of course, taking longer to start families and start careers and get married. Um, but for a long time, it was assumed that adolescence was actually beginning a little bit earlier. So ex adolescence was kind of extended, and it was extended into childhood, and then it was also extended into young adulthood, and that that was explaining the trends. But I was interested in seeing, well, you know, was that true? And what was happening with adolescents and what they were doing. And that's really relevant 
to those of us who teach at the college level, because that means that's who we're getting in the door when we get, you know, our, especially our first time students, 18, 19 years old, you know, who are coming straight from high school to try to understand, you know, what experiences did they have in high school? So there's this one survey that looks at high school seniors and has data going all the way back to 1976. And it turns out high school seniors now are much less likely to have their driver's license by right before graduation. They're less likely to have had a paid job during the school year. They're less likely to have tried alcohol. They go out, they go out without their parents less often. They're less likely to uh, go on dates. So all of these things that adults do and children don't that have historically been milestones of adolescence, 17 and 18 year olds are getting to high school graduation, um, more of them without doing these things. And, you know, the majority still do these things, but there's a much larger segment who doesn't. And on average, they're just having less experience with independence. So that, I think, impacts people in the classroom because uh, we're getting, especially freshman students, but this takes some time to wear off, who um, maybe have trouble making their own decisions because they just haven't gone out as much or had a job or had a driver's license and just have less experience with independence, are much more used to adults telling them what to do and haven't developed some of those skills for managing their time and making decisions that we might have expected even 10 years ago among 18 year olds. One of the, the impacts I saw of that in your book was you were talking about how um, uh, the iGen is less likely to have had alcohol when they're 12, 14, 16, 18 than prior generations are. And yet by the time they're 21, 24, they've sort of caught up. And so that whole sequence of, of getting used to drinking is sort of truncated and, um, and maybe this leads to more binge drinking. Do you think that applies also to, to dating, to, to some of these other, uh, are they growing up sort of very fast and in a very short period of time between right when they're hitting college, between 18 and 20, where they're suddenly dating, drinking, doing all these other things that used to be more spread out over time? Yeah, it, it, it looks that way um, because the you know high school seniors, they have less experience with alcohol, they have less experience with dating, they have fewer of them have had sex, that's the CDC data shows that. So then they get to college and uh, those of us who teach on college campuses, even remotely, know that a lot of college campuses are places where there's lots of sex, lots of dating, lots of alcohol. And these, especially the freshmen, are they kind of come in, they have to go from zero to 60 really quick in this environment. And they just haven't had as much experience with that. And it's, it's an interesting phenomenon because most parents are thrilled by this. They're thrilled that their 17, 18 year olds have less experience with sex and alcohol. But then once they go off to college, that changes pretty quickly. And there's some data to suggest, some studies to suggest based on these big surveys that that is potentially problematic when there's that huge ramp up in drinking between, say, 18 and 21, that, that may lead to more binge drinking. It does just in general mean, you know, you have a larger group of young people who are less experienced with these things once they arrive at college. And do you think that uh, sort of um, gestalt shift, that, that sudden shift in how they're living, I would think that that would cause a lot of psychological stress. Um, do you think that that's part of the contributor um, you know, they have many other stressors, but do you think that that sudden shift in the way of their life at 18 to 20 is contributing to the, the depression that you're seeing within this generation? Yeah, so I'll, I'll back up a minute and describe some of that data, because that was the other thing that really, really uh, popped up in these big surveys was around 2011 or 2012, there was a sudden uptick in the percentage of teens who said that they felt lonely and left out those who said they felt like they couldn't do anything right or that they didn't enjoy life, which are classic symptoms of depression, shows up in other big national screening studies as well. Um, almost 60% increase in teens who suffer from major depressive episodes, this clinical level depression that really needs treatment. Uh, Self-harm behaviors like cutting have gone up. Suicide rate has gone up. And across the board, since about 2011, there's been these pronounced increases, not just in surveys of how people are feeling, but in behaviors and mental health overall, you know, has really unfortunately taken a, a dive among teens. And there's some evidence to suggest that there's also a rise among young adults, college age young adults as well. So uh, the question then is why? 
um, the stress and lack of independence might play somewhat of a part, but those trends have been going on since around the late 1990s. So they are probably not the primary cause of the, the rise in anxiety and depression, although they may play a part if they kind of hit a tipping point. Uh, but there was something else that happened around 2011 or 2012, which is that's when most Americans got smartphones. So according to the Pew Research Center, that's when the percentage of people who owned a smartphone crossed 50%. And that's also when social media went from being optional to mandatory almost uh, among high school students. So uh, they, there's another element of this. It's not just spending time you know, on the phone, which is fine up, you know, up to a certain point of an hour or two a day. It's also that young people started spending less time with their friends face to face. So during their leisure time, they became more likely to communicate with their friends through their phones and less likely to hang out with their friends face to face. So that combination is not a good one for mental health. You know, they want to do some online communication. There's something wrong with that. It is not a big deal, even, you know, if it's part of leisure time, but if it starts to replace leisure time spent hanging out with people face to face, then it can be a problem. And one of the paradoxes that you identified and you had um, some really good language from students that you'd talked to was saying that social media is a place for sort of happy postings. You post happy pictures of, of great things on Instagram and Facebook and, and sort of the best in life. But, um, you know, obviously there's surveys out now that show that uh, usage of Instagram, usage of Facebook, uh, the more you use, the more that's tied to uh, feelings of depression or at least feelings of, of sadness related to them. And there's this, as you say, a, a FOMO, a fear of missing out uh, that the iGen is experiencing, but that also that we're seeing, you know, through psychological studies with older generations. So do you think this is something that's sort of, um, it doesn't matter what generation you're in, that, that just usage of social media uh, contributes to depression? Or do you think this is something um, that is, uh, you know, added a greater order of magnitude, I guess, with the iGen. Yeah, I think I think it's the latter. So um, there's definitely a lot of studies on adults, in particular young adults, and it does show those who spend more time on social media are more likely to be lonely and depressed. Um, there's always the question of causation. Maybe people are lonely and depressed, spend more time on social media. There's studies that follow people over time, suggest at least some of it and probably most of it goes from using those media uh, for too many hours a day and then, you know, feeling more lonely and depressed. Uh, and that a lot of that data is based on adults and, and, and young adults in particular. Um, but the mental health trends tend to show up the most strongly among teens and college age young adults and not as much in people say over the age of about 26. So that suggests to me that, you know, these technologies are having an impact they're having the biggest impact on the younger people, the teens and, and the youngest young adults. And that might be because older adults are more likely, say, to be married and have their kids in the home and to have already established these friendships that they have with people. It may not have as much impact as it does on adolescents and young adults who are still forming those friendships. Yeah, and you, you mentioned... Um at least there were a couple of instances where you're talking to sort of 20 and 22 year olds in the book who um, seem to have in some ways matured beyond the uh, desire for instant gratification of likes and, and shares and hearts and everything else in social media. Um, do you think that the millennials as a generation are, are I guess, reevaluating, reexamining the value of face-to-face -face interaction with other people and that maybe some of the older iGen are having that same experience of growing beyond social media? Um, do you think that's part of the divide between the two generations as a recognition of the value, differential value of face-to-face -face versus online communication? Well, it's interesting is even some of the, the youngest iGen teens that I talk to recognize that being on their phone all the time is not a good way to live. I think they know that this isn't always the best, but it feels mandatory to them they have the FOMO of missing out if they put their phone down. Um, they're afraid that if they don't text back right away, their friend's going to assume that they're mad at them. And we shouldn't forget, too, that a lot of these apps, especially social media apps, are designed to be addictive. I mean, we know that you know, in the last year, more and more Silicon Valley executives have spoken out about this, and it makes sense. 
Um, the more time you spend on Facebook, the more money the company makes. That's also true for Snapchat and you know a lot of these other apps. So they're specifically designed to keep people on them as long as possible. So we really shouldn't be surprised that people have a hard time putting them down. Yeah. Um, I guess what are the, some of the implications that you're seeing for this in, in your own teaching or in higher education in general? How is, how is what you've observed affecting your, your own classroom and how you deal with your current students? Yeah, so my, my philosophy with a lot of these changes is it has to be balanced. That on the one hand, you definitely want to meet the generation where they are. And that's often online and it's often with videos, especially short videos and harnessing technology for these good purposes. Um, but I also believe that we have to still get across complex material and we still have to make sure that we have students who are paying attention uh, in the physical classroom when that's how we're teaching. And so, you know, it really has to be this balance. I think technology works the best when it's a more collective experience for the students, when it's not a distraction, when it's not, you know, they're in an online lecture or a physical lecture and they're, they're looking at their phone and being distracted by their phone. I think that's where it's a detriment, but it can be used for so many beneficial things like distance learning, like uh, using short videos, using images. Uh, and I, I think uh, using interactive textbooks, you know, all of these things that we can do um, with course materials and with class time that can harness this technology and in that way meet the generation where they are because they do still need to read. Um, one thing that we didn't cover is this uh, iGen is reading a lot less uh, percentage of high school seniors who say that they read a book, magazine, or newspaper every day or almost every day has plummeted from 60% in 1976 to 16% in 2016. So they're reading stuff online often, but it's short. So long form text is what's really declined. And to get across complex material, you need them to do that. Um, but, you know, there's balances that we can strike in, you know, maybe they read a short portion and they watch a video or do an activity. And it's the same thing in the classroom that we have to get across uh, the material, whether that's, you know, an online lecture versus uh, in person, either way, that you can only talk for so long and then you have to have an activity or a question or a video or something else. Yeah. And in the book you mentioned, you know, that maybe it is reasonable to say that uh, the traditional 800 page textbook isn't, isn't super interesting. Um, have you moved away from a traditional textbook in your own classes? Have you, you know, incorporated some of these video and, and more interactive texts into your class? Yeah, I have. So I, I use a electronic textbook now um, it's uh, through Pearson's Revel system. A lot of other publishers have a, you know, similar types of platforms. Um, and just for full disclosure, I'm involved in, in uh, a textbook project with Pearson and another with, uh, with McGraw-Hill. So it's a personality psychology textbook and a social psychology textbook. So I've had a lot of experience with you know, the different platforms and you know, what they can do. And also with you know, what today's students really want out of a book. Um, you know, I've learned that through my own teaching as well. So the book I use now um, has embedded videos uh, because it's a personality psychology. We have questionnaires. I think that can be done across psychology and many of the social sciences. And I think a lot of disciplines can, can do this. And that's what's wonderful. We have the technology that can do that now. The students can take a questionnaire um, and at least in my book, the thing that was really important to me is it was the real questionnaire. It was the actual questionnaires that are used in personality psychology research, current research. And they can take one of those and get the results compared to a norm sample. Um, we have ours like, so it's on a bell curve. So we're kind of being tricky and trying to teach them statistics at the same time. Um, and so it's, it's got this element of they're learning about themselves. It's interactive. They're not just being talked to. Um, so they really learn, say, what extroversion actually is because they take the question, the questionnaire, and they learn how it's measured with the real questionnaire. So that's some of the things that you can do with course materials now that I think are really wonderful and interactive. And they're still reading, but it's not, you know, 800 pages. It's shorter and they read a, and they read some text and then they take a questionnaire and then they read some text and then they watch a video. And I think it, it uh, helps with this generation, kind of eases them in to reading long form text, which they still need to do. It's just this is a more friendly way for them to do it. 
Yeah, and I think you know traditional teaching principles of a more active learning style, you know, uh, more engagement with the audience and uh, and more authentic, uh, you know, in terms of having them see how it plays out in their own life. Um, yeah. So things that maybe were just as applicable for the last generation as this one. Um, yeah. One of the the questions that came in from the audience was, what are some strategies we can use to help students be mindful of their social media usage, but without necessarily having them share their social media usage with with us or with each other? How can we allow them both privacy and then also encourage mindfulness at the same time? Yeah, you know, this is always always the balance because, you know, we don't want to be, you know, the old person shaking our fingers saying, get off Facebook, get off Instagram, get off Snapchat, you know, and not to mention a lot of us use those technologies as well and use those social media sites too. Um, you know, it, it's going to depend, I think, at least somewhat on the discipline. So, you know, if you're teaching in psychology or uh, in anything around health, you know, public health or any of those disciplines, um, you can talk about some of the research in this area. And students love to talk about the research in this area. They're really, really fascinated by it because they spend a lot of time online. They know that this is a different thing than, uh, you know, their parents did when they were young. So they're really interested, you know, in hearing about that. So that's a really good way to introduce it is to say, you'll hear some of the research on it, and then you can have a discussion about what it means. Um, and I think that's the easiest and most natural way if it, if it um, can, you know, fit into uh, your, your course topics. Apart from that, if it doesn't, if you're teaching, you know, math or physics or something else where it's a little harder to directly relate it, um, I think just having a discussion, first class or second class around then of, well, and this, this is going to vary a little bit depending, you know, online teaching versus physical, but something around, hey, I want us to be present with each other when we're in class. And that's going to mean putting your phone on airplane mode or, or not even on vibrate, but on airplane mode. So you're not getting notifications and just putting it down so we can be present with each other because we have this hour and 15 minutes, you know, twice a week. And that's the time that we have to discuss issues and be present with each other. So that should be a time when we uh, are not distracted just to emphasize that. Yeah, I think that's a really good way of putting it. I, as I was reading, I was thinking about both my students and my own daughter. I've got a six-year-old uh, who fits nicely into this iGen uh, experience. And, and yeah, that was the way I was thinking about phrasing it with her is just be present, uh, you know, whether it's at dinner or, uh, or out with friends. Um, just, you know, experience those things rather than just your phone. Um, yeah. Are there, uh, I, I was thinking about, you know, in, in relation to both uh, mental health and also in relation to uh, uh, driver's licenses, are there things that you're seeing at the university level? Um, I think San Diego State is somewhat similar to the University of Oklahoma where I am, where a lot of our students do need to drive to campus and do live on campus as freshmen, but in the past have always moved off of campus as sophomores. Um, do you find that more students are wanting to stay on campus, more, wanting to stay in more structured environments where they have uh, a semi-house-like feel to it? Are, they, um, are, are there other things that that you see from a, an institutional perspective that are changing with this generation? Yeah, and this this certainly could be coincidental just with the way our particular campus has gone, but we have that. We have a lot more. We used to have no freshman dorms. Now we have a lot, and, and uh, uh, I think we may even have a requirement for um, freshmen to live on campus. So there is definitely more um, of that kind of on-campus supervisory type of feel um, than there used to be. You know, with that said, we also have a lot of students who transfer in from community colleges and who are driving and who are working jobs. And so, you know, I have a lot of students who are, you know, between the ages of 25 and 35. So they're kind of in a, in a different category. Um, but the younger students that I get, um, I, I think many of them do sort of reflect this research that they are a little less independent. They seem a little bit more um, sheltered. Uh, it, it also sometimes means, and this shows up in some survey questions too, that um, they have, they're kind of, because they're kind of used to their parents helping them, they sort of sometimes will see faculty in that way, which has upsides and downsides. Um, so the, the upside can be that if we tell them, look, you need to do this, this, and this, they'll listen to that. They don't have, you know, 
the authority problem that's you know that some people used to talk about with with previous generations quite as much because they had a lot of respect for their parents and they're very close to their parents and their parents supervised them so closely for so long. Um, on the other hand, uh, and this is partially just being female faculty, if they see me as their mom, that is not a good development. So you have to kind of make sure that that's uh, not going on. Do you think that has implications for how we mentor? I mean, not just in the classroom with, you know, 100 students at a time, but how we, you know, I guess there is more room for mentoring students. There is more maybe need for it. Um, but also we need to be careful about how we set up boundaries with those students. Yeah. Yeah. I think mentoring is really big. And, you know, I think a lot of folks in student affairs have recognized this as well, that especially the first year students coming in, that they just need more advice and more supervision because that's what they got in high school that, you know, 18 year olds are just not as adult as they used to be. I, I, I never want to use the word mature because in some ways you could say it's more mature to not have sex or drink alcohol as a high school student, but they're not as adult. They just haven't had as much, many experiences with that. So um, that piece of mentoring and you know, lifestyle instruction about how to manage things uh, is really welcome, I think. One of the other implications there, you talk about this more in the book and we haven't touched on it yet, was that um, when they're in high school, they tend to have, they tend to work less than they used to. They tend to have less, uh, less jobs. And then even those that do have jobs are working less hours. Um, do you see that, uh, one, a delayed sense of responsibility and, and sort of what working a minimum wage job does for you in terms of being responsible, but two, also just having less money, having less, uh, less resources as they enter college and how that, how does that affect them? Yeah. And of course, tuition has far outpaced inflation yeah. and so many more students are having to take out loans. Uh, so yeah, the money problem is, is big. Um, for, for my students, at least once by the time they, they uh, get to SDSU and they're in the upper division classes that I teach, a lot of them are working jobs and that actually gives them money, but then they also have less time for their schoolwork. So that is a tough balance. It's always that time and time versus money conundrum. Um, but then there's also, for the younger students, certainly that issue um, of many people make that case that working a job, even if it's just a job that's rote, teaches you responsibility. And there's certainly some data to suggest that that is true. And so with fewer students having that experience as high school students, that sense of responsibility sometimes isn't there. Um, and of course, there's exceptions you know, to this, and this is usually just a minority of students, but I think pretty much every faculty member has had at least a few students every semester where they don't seem to get the concept of here, here's the syllabus, and I'm not going to remind you when things are due. And yes, this deadline is a true deadline, and no, you can't, you know, turn it in late. Um, and I think with millennials 10 years ago, it was more of an entitled attitude of like, oh, you know, I'm special, and you got to let me turn in late because I'm special. Um, and again, that was, you know, not everybody is a minority, but it was a very vocal minority sometimes. And now with iGen, I think it's almost like, wait, you're not going to remind me? And, and, you know, why can't I turn this in late? What's the big deal? It's maybe not as entitled, but it's more the expectation of handholding, I guess, is the easiest way to yeah. put it. And do you find, I mean, you said earlier that they don't seem to rebel against authority as much. Maybe they're more comfortable with handholding and they've got a cell phone on them at all times. So are there sort of communication strategies that you're implementing to, you know, to ping them all the time to say, you know, reminder, homework's due on Friday or whatever? Yeah. So that's, that's always a balancing act, I think. You know, I think if you're teaching first year students, especially in fall semester, that is something to consider, whether there's some kind of reminder system. But my advice would be do that for the first, say, month of the semester and then tell them, look, that's going to stop because eventually they're going to need to do this on their own. I mean, that's how college always used to be. And I think it's always the question of how much we're going to cater to them versus how much we're not going to do that. Um, but I think it is true. First year students need that guidance a little bit more. And so we might want to give it to them, but we have to ease them into taking responsibility for themselves because that has to happen eventually. Yeah. Now the other things, I mean, um, yeah, I guess the other uh, way I was thinking about it and in coming into this was, that maybe we have more of a complementary role than we used to in helping students to develop in some of these ways that have been delayed. Um, maybe it is, you know, less handholding and, and pushing them to be more responsible. Maybe it's helping to have more social engagement, have more activities around campus 
where they can engage face to face and encouraging, you know, moving away from uh, technological interaction. Are there, are there things that either we can do as faculty members or um, as departments, as, as student affairs to supplement their development to, to help them become, you know, individual adults? Yeah, so some universities are uh, either are doing this or thinking about having technology free zones on campus. Um, and so they're already for years tried to encourage students to get together face to face and, and, and do those things. But sometimes you do that and they're still on phones, um, true for adults too. So there's some movement toward that idea of, and you can do this in the classroom too, just of spaces where we're going to put phones away. And that's the interesting thing, you know, because perhaps of iGen having a little less problem with authority, they'll do that. And they're open to that. If everybody is doing it, then they're more open to the idea. And of course, you, you know, there's always going to be a few people who aren't going to like that. But I've found that students actually really respond to that. So, you know, another example of something that can be done in, in terms of teaching. So, so a faculty member told me this once that she has her students do an assignment where they have to put away all their technology for an hour go out in nature wherever they like and sit and appreciate nature and let their mind wander. So she said she expected huge pushback on this. Nobody would want to do it, that if they did it, they would hate it. That was students' favorite assignment all semester. And then they had, they had to write about the experience. And she said the essays that she got were amazing, that they just raved about being able to take a break from technology, that it was a relief and that they really liked having that experience where they weren't responding to things every few seconds. Um, yeah, I, I, I would anticipate a lot of pushback there, but, uh, uh, but yeah, um, well, and you talked about how, you know, actually even doing homework leads to less depression, uh, for this, this age group that they find fulfillment in doing some of those more traditional things and just disengaging from texting, uh, at times, yeah. even though they don't want to. And as you said, it's an addiction, um, I think, and, and yeah. when we set down addictions, uh, you know, even if it's to do hard work, that's often beneficial. Um, we do have a couple of text questions from the audience, so I was going to see if Christopher could help uh, share those up on screen. Um, so how do we support uh, our first gen under uh, underrepresented students from this iGen group without the handholding? So how do we um, help with first generational students? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and just to be clear, I think especially for those first year students, whether they're, you know, first generation to go to college or not, a little bit of handhelding is okay, especially in the first month or so. Um, and I think you just, I mean, I think this is true for everybody, but maybe even more true for the, the those who are the first in their family to go to college, of uh, just telling them how it works. You know, here's the syllabus. Here's how the syllabus works. And, it, you know, I may, I'm going to help you along a little bit in the first few weeks, but it is your responsibility to meet these deadlines and you know, develop an organizational system, set notifications on your phone if you want, um, here's how to do it. And then um, I, I also put study tips in my syllabus, make your own review sheet, uh, multitasking isn't actually possible for the human brain, so you have to turn the TV off and put the phone away uh, when you're doing your reading and your homework. Um, here's some books on Amazon that can tell you about um, good study skills, things like that, to try to then level the playing field a little bit and give them that information up front and tell them, look, read the syllabus because it's not just the course calendar. It has a bunch of stuff in there about how to get a good grade in this class. Yeah, we do something similar for all of our online courses is that we've got um, literally looks like a Candyland roadmap and it just talks you through various points in the semester that you need to be you know, checking on your grades a couple weeks in, making sure that your grades are showing up in the assignment book. As the faculty member, checking with all of your students about three weeks in to, to make sure everybody's logged in and is doing their work. And so just, uh, yeah, very much sort of laying out a schedule of, of expectations and, uh, uh, and checkpoints. Um, oh, and she says, we have it by text. Yeah, so what are some of the strategies we can use to help students be mindful of their social media usage uh, without necessarily shaming them about their social media. So how do we help them be mindful but not shameful, I suppose? Yeah. So what the research suggests is that a little bit of technology, even a little bit of social media, is fine. It helps us keep up with 
what's going on and keep us connected that really the negative effects don't show up until over two hours or so use of every day or for social media it's more like an hour and a half um so the idea is limited use so it's not okay this stuff is always bad and you have to take all of it away and delete all of your accounts it's just think about think about how much time you're spending on this and realize that these companies are making more money the more time you spend on these sites so to yeah go ahead and use them but to limit your use and you know i think that that argument about uh, the Silicon Valley companies making money off of this is often useful, especially for this age group, because that's not something they, a lot of them have really considered. And when they hear that, it helps them think twice about, wait, maybe I shouldn't be spending three hours a day on this. Uh, and then also come out and talk about, you know, that they, that there's some addictive elements to this, that, you know, realize you're getting sucked in. You're not the only one that it's designed to be this way. I think that takes a lot of the shame out of it. And I think it's especially true if you put that emphasis on, look, you're not, you don't have to give it up, but use it in a limited way. Yeah. I guess uh, one of the places where we, we I want students to be on screen time and in, uh, I don't know if, you, if it's fair to call it a social media, but is in discussion boards, uh, especially in online classes and in blended classes. Sure. Um, do you see uh, discussion boards, I guess Reddit more broadly, um, but discussion boards, especially for classes, as being a fairly healthy place, as being somehow distinct from um, the other social media? Yeah, I mean, certainly. So the, the, the discussion board for a class, um, it, you know, plays a different role. It's, you know, it's, it's not a leisure time entertainment thing. It is homework. And at least in theory, what you're supposed to be doing is thinking about ideas, exchanging ideas with your fellow classmates, you know, applying the research to your own life. Um, as most people know who have uh, done discussion boards, you do have to put the ground rules out. And make it clear that, you know, this is not a reality TV show where we're going to be clawing each other's eyes out. We want to be nice and avoid ad hominem attacks and watch your tone and all of these types of things. But that there's a way to have a uh, discussion and to share ideas uh, that can be really, really positive. And I think also as a faculty member, you do have to keep an eye on those discussion boards and, uh, you know, perhaps step in if it goes off the rails. Um, but for the most part, I think they can be a really beneficial thing. And I, they're in a, I think they're in a different category than social media, at least the stuff that, that, um, I've seen it's social media and leisure time. It's not this, you know, the idea of it being homework where I don't, I don't think there's those negative, uh, downsides, not to mention, I don't think anybody ever spent four hours a day on a classroom discussion board. <laughs> Kind of hope not. Yeah. Um, do you see? I mean, is there? Have you thought about? Is there a way to use the discussion boards in a class to use the, the interactions within a class uh, to model uh, sort of better netiquette to to date myself in terms? Yeah. Um, but to you know to use those types of discussions and say this is a this is a healthy discussion as opposed to you know the bullying that you might get elsewhere. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Um, and I think that's you know a great benefit. You know, overall, not just for um, having good rules of etiquette online, but also to model a way to have discussions that could, you know, be face to face as well. Cause that's another thing that has gotten a lot of attention in the last few years is that at least on some campuses, there's the idea of there's certain things that you can't say and that you don't want to have a discussion with somebody else face to face because it might upset you. And that there's, you know, just this, some people have argued anyway, a chilling effect on um, the free exchange of ideas. And that's a complex issue, and I'm not going to you know, go into all of the details with that, except to say, clearly, in a college environment, we do need to be able to discuss ideas. And if uh, students get used to doing that on discussion boards and learn how to have a civil discussion, even with people they might disagree with, I think that's a wonderful model. Yeah, I agree. Um, we've got a couple of more text questions. Let's see if uh, Chris can throw another one up. What's one strategy you would recommend to educators, given what you've learned from work? So just any strategy for educators on, uh, on yeah. dealing with the iGen. Yeah, um, it's difficult to choose just one. Um, I guess just taking into not just not just this generation, but also just practical concerns. I think one of the easiest ones to implement is the use of short videos, whether that's in course materials where it's integrated or in online or face-to-face uh, -face classrooms. 
of just using short videos. And you don't want to overdo that. You don't want your whole class to be videos, but, um, you know, under three minutes, some, sometimes you can go get away with longer if it's a really good one that's really relevant for the course topic. But, you know, short videos that get across course concepts. Uh, and again, that's going to vary by discipline, but things that can, you know, you've got the concept, you describe what the, what it is, and then the video is a nice example or illustration of something um, that you want to demonstrate. Um, I, I found that to be effective. Yeah, I used that strategy in one of my history classes, and then I paired it with micro assessments. So the assessments would be on, you know, a particular short video. And so you've watched a, a three minute video, just write a couple of sentences off of this. And That's sort of great. a very short feedback loop, uh, very, you know, sort of appealing to a shorter attention span. But um, yeah. and one more text question that, that Chris can throw up for us. Is there more parental involvement with college students? Uh, I, I think yes. And are you finding that to be a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah. So, you know, I go around the country giving talks at uh, colleges and universities, and I often meet the, you know, folks who are working in student affairs and student life. And when I ask them, especially those who have been there for a while, what's the biggest difference that you've noticed in students and on campuses in the last 10 to 20 years? Before I even finish asking the question, the first thing that they say is the involvement of the parents, that it is more, that parents are more involved. Um, so with it, where they see it is if there's a conflict with the roommate, sometimes it's the parent who calls. Then where faculty sometimes see it is if uh, they don't like the grade, sometimes it'll be the parent who will get involved and complain about the grade and instead of, of it being the student. Um, and is that a good thing or, or a bad thing? You know, in K through 12, parental involvement is mostly good. At the college level, especially once you get beyond the first few weeks, I'm not as convinced because yeah. students need to start learning how to make those decisions on their own, how to make those complaints on their own, how to deal with those conflicts on their own. Because, you know, as college faculty, our job, as I see it anyway, is to take high school students and turn them into workers. And when you think about what the skills that they're going to need when they get those jobs and they graduate and they get those jobs and have a boss, um, let's hope their parents are not going to be solving their conflicts for them anymore. So I think that's a transition period where they need to be learning those skills. So I, I think they need to be doing those things on their own. Yeah, I'm just trying to imagine a, a roommate conflict and what would have happened if one of my friend's parents gave me a call or something, or gave my parents a call. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, interesting dynamics. Um, and we do get a lot of stories of, uh, of parents calling in both to the faculty member and to the administration to, to note something. And it can be a fear of faculty members too. You know, it's a new form of, of negative feedback from your students to have negative feedback from their parents uh, to, your, yeah. your departmental, uh, to your department. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, there are so many other topics in your book, but we're going to get to, to hear more from you at the, uh, at the conference and in your keynote. And so I guess this might be a, a good place to leave it. Are there any thoughts that you want to leave us with? Any, uh, any parting shots? Um, I think, you know, one summary is just to, to realize that traditional age college students are no longer millennials. And it's not just in terms of the label that, sure, there are some things that you know, students of all generations have in common, and there's plenty of things that are not going to be different, but that these iGen students are different from the students you had even a few years ago, and that's going to continue to head in that direction. So just know that some of the challenges are going to be a little bit different in terms of their confidence and their participation um, and how much time they spend on technology. So that just that they're a different group, and it it pays to, to learn about them and, and uh, empathize with them and think about their experience, experiences that they've had before, before they come to your classroom. Yeah, that was my big takeaway was, was uh, ways to connect with this generation, ways to, um, to maybe use their, their technological use uh, with them, but then also, mm -hmm. yeah, just some of those things that we can do to, to help them out. Um, yeah. But thank you again for joining us, and, uh, and I can't wait for November and for the conference to start up. Um, again, go out and get uh, Gene's book um, or read through. Gene's published a, a ton of articles on all of this, and you can find uh, links from any of those articles on our website. Um, but the, this latest book is iGen, Why Today's Super Connected Kids Are Growing Up Less Rebellious, which I'm happy about, uh, More Tolerant, Less Happy, 
and completely unprepared for adulthood and what that means for the rest of us. Um, useful if you've got kids, more useful as an educator. Um, check it out before we get to November. Thank you so much for joining us, Gene, and uh, we'll post this video and all these links up uh, on the OLC website. But all right, great. Thank you, everybody, for coming in. Thanks to uh, Chris also for hosting us here in Shindig, and we'll be back here next week.